Hey, Ben. Hey there, guys. Hey, how are you doing, Ben? Good, how are you? Very well. It's good to talk to you again. You too. Your hair wasn't that long last time, was it? You didn't have those dreads. Yeah, I did. They were just in the back. <laughs> they were just in the back? Okay. <laughs> I can hide them. I thought your hair was... Maybe it was a, a still photo I saw of you. Your hair was shorter. Yeah, it's just I can hide it better sometimes. <laughs> how are you doing, so it looks man? good. You look like you're doing well. I'm doing awesome, man. I'm here at AVTM uh, hanging out with the crew here with Daryl. Awesome. And, Congratulations, uh, by the way. It's a great gig. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here to help Adam out and... Uh, in his time of need and to keep spreading the message of liberty man and i really wanted to catch up with you uh first of all i wanted to give you a chance let's talk about your latest project that is now launched uh, truth and media tell us all about that sure the project uh, i think it's kind of self-descriptive there right the truth and media project i guess truth is a relative term to some people because it's like well whose truth your truth my truth what we're trying to cut through is is really stick to constitutional truth uh focusing on constitutional liberty civil liberties uh, looking at what rule of law says and standing up for people who essentially are having their rights taken away by government that is increasingly large um, and believes that really you don't have any rights. You don't have any personal privacy. That You don't have any rights to your own body. You don't have a right to uh, your own belief system anymore. And so that you're really just a, a product of the state, that they own you and they control you. And so what we're really trying to do is stand up to that. We released a piece, by the way, um, just a couple of days ago. Uh, it's our new set of crowdsourced episodes. We went through a crowdsourcing process, and we've raised enough to create now 10 episodes. So it was eight, and we've gotten more coming in. So Great. we're up to 10 episodes now. We just released the first one this week, and it's all about the NSA using um, trademark and copyright claims to shut down a guy's website who was critical of it. I just watched that episode yesterday. That was, that was good work. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really important story because this guy, Dan McCall, who has a T-shirt company called Liberty Maniacs, he took this shirt, he put it out on, on a marketplace called Zazzle. A lot of your uh, viewers, listeners might know what Zazzle is. So he puts it up on Zazzle, and then a couple of days later it gets pulled down, and they claim it's because the owner of the copyright, in this case, the NSA, um, was claiming that his T-shirt infringed on their copyright. Well, the T-shirt, and you got to go out and watch the story because you can see it for yourself, but it's just the NSA logo, and then underneath it, it he's changed it. Uh, their logo. You know, Instead of United States of America, it says, Peeping While You're Sleeping. <laughs> And then underneath it, it says, the NSA, the only part of government that actually listens. So it's, it's a parody. It's uh, you know, kind of making fun of them, which is completely, by the way, within his right as uh, a U.S. citizen to use parody as part of fair use. But the NSA said it's their copyright. You can't criticize us, so pull it down. And so it, it was pulled down. Um, and by the way, since that story's been released, I've had two other people contact me uh, who have had items either pulled from Zazzle or who were confronted by the U.S. Park Service. Uh, for a parody they did about them being threatened with jail time and fines. So we're seeing that this is actually a pattern that's um, been developing for some time where they're trying to, to squash criticism by claiming that it's an infringement of their copyright. So government um, logos are copyright, copyrighted? Well, they're saying it's their intellectual property, right? So, I mean, I, it's possible. It's possible that the NSA's logo is copywritten, even though... Technically, it would be property of the people because yeah. they're a government agency. So the, I don't see how the trademark could belong to the government since the government doesn't belong to itself in theory. Um, even so, you can claim intellectual property. But see, here's the point we make in the story, and this is what's really important about this, is that when you talk about Internet laws like SOPA and PIPA and CISPA, that's what they're designed to do. They're set up as intellectual property bills Essentially saying, if someone makes an intellectual property claim, saying you're infringing on my IP, um, the NSA, DHS, you know, Homeland Security can come in and shut down your whole website. There's already a process through law, meaning uh, courts that are already established for this. There's already copyright law. If I believe you're infringing on my copyright, I can take you to court over it. Okay, there's a process for that. If the NSA really believes that they have a copyright or a trademark here that's being infringed on, you can go to court over it. But they're not doing that. Instead, they're simply going in and hammering these little guys and saying, well, Zazzle, take down you know, that image, that logo, or else. And Zazzle's going to listen to them because, as we point out, the NSA doesn't have to be right. They just muscle over people. Yeah, and that seems to be the way the government is moving more and more uh, in this country. 
What are your thoughts on um, the the end of the Bradley Manning and now Chelsea Manning, uh, the trial there? What are your thoughts on that situation? Well, I think it's a sad situation, um, and mostly sad, obviously, for Manning himself. But the bigger issue there is I still see a lot of Americans uh, who see Bradley Manning as a bad guy. Um, they're very negative about him. And, well, Manning shouldn't have released what he released. He didn't have the right to do that, and he makes us, he makes us unsafe by doing this. It concerns me because I think most of the people who say that could not honestly tell you why it makes us unsafe for him to do this. Why we are less safe by knowing more. And they say, well, it fuels anger against the United States. It fuels frustration from people around the world when this kind of stuff is out there. Okay, but maybe the problem then is what we're doing around the world, not so much the fact that someone is revealing it. And, and I think that's a leap that people still have to make that Unfortunately, a lot of them are not necessarily making. I will say I'm happy about the fact that more and more people seem to be agreeing that Edward Snowden did the right thing. And that public opinion, you know, it was kind of split in the beginning. It shifted away from him when he w went to Russia, right? Because it's like, oh, he's associated with the Russians. That must mean he's bad. Yeah. He's a bad guy now because he went to Russia. And I think people are now starting to come back the other way. The more they're seeing that the NSA is doing this more and more and have fewer and fewer answers... And then you've got guys like Justin Amash, uh, Congressman Justin Amash, who's out there, you know, fighting against it. And as, as more and more lawmakers are standing up to it, I think the general public is saying, you know what, maybe he did a really good thing here. And so I'm optimistic about that. Yeah, I think we're all trying to remain optimistic about it. I was in the courtroom yesterday when they read the, the verdict, and it was... It was pretty difficult to be in there. They, they rushed through it pretty quickly, and um, you know, a group of us shouted out, things to Bradley, like, you're a Bra Bradley Manning, you're a hero, we're, we're all with you, and things like that, and as soon as that began happening, they ran him out of there, and uh, they quickly, you know, whisked us all away, so it was very fast, they weren't trying to give anybody a chance to, uh, to see him very long, uh, the whole thing was probably less than five minutes in the courtroom itself, and um, it, it, it was heart-wrenching, really, to watch and to sit there and realize that these people in this tiny room just made this decision that is going to affect people all around the world, and obviously, uh, Bradley Manning. Absolutely. Well, and, and to that point, I think that what government, what the military, what the DOD, the Pentagon need to realize, and I think they do realize it, is that they've already lost this battle generationally. So generationally, younger people just don't, they don't side with them. And I think I, I've heard from different people who say this is very scary because, you know, guys like Manning and guys like Snowden are seen as heroes instead of as enemies of the state. Well, that's because they, there is a growing resistance to this idea. And generationally, I think it's already been lost for those who are in power right now. It just has to play out over time. And then, of course, having to push through whatever um, propaganda we have to endure in order for them to make up for that or to try to, to shift public opinion. So, I mean, we have President Obama yesterday saying that, that basically that all the leaks are lies, essentially is what he's alluding to. He's saying that Despite information about 75% of domestic Internet communication being stored, that was just recently revealed by the Wall Street Journal, Obama right. is saying that there is no spy he believes that there's no spying on Americans taking place. He's still continuing to, uh, to push that line. I mean, and as you said, most Americans, especially the younger generations, are losing faith in the uh, ruling class in this country. I, I feel like we're moving past a point where people are going to believe voting is the answer. I mean, and how, how is that shaping this country, the, the loss of trust in our, our so-called leaders? Well, and, and as, you, as you say that, um, that's actually my biggest concern, is that um, people will begin to believe that they can't fix the system within the system, uh, and therefore, whether it's violent means, whether it's taking up arms, um, you know, that they believe that that becomes the answer. And, and unfortunately, I think there are a lot of folks... Uh, on the uh, totalitarian side who would like you to believe that's your only option because they're hoping that happens so they can clamp down on everyone. Um, I think there are more and more people who are, who are beginning to believe that. I agree with you. I think that's part of what we're trying to do is to, to educate people and to also work through a process um, of saying, okay, so then what can we do to actually shift things and, and to make a difference? Uh, one of the things we're doing with our project is we're really trying to reach people on a local level and work to establish some practices so that um, in municipalities, city councils, um, on the local level, we begin to fight for our freedoms, meaning we're fighting against things like red light cameras and license plate readers. 
or in Colorado, we did a story about the fact that lawmakers there have quote unquote invisible license plates where you, they, they can actually uh, go past a license plate reader or run a red light camera and they don't get a ticket for it. So they've given themselves that authority, but then they want everybody else to essentially fund things through, through tickets. And so uh, what we want to see is, is uh, empowerment for people on a yeah. local level because that's where it's the easiest to make changes. You know, when you look at the big scope of things, you might say, how are we ever going to change Washington? How are we ever going to change the NSA and, and spying? Okay, let's, let's just talk on a local level. Can you stop drones over your town? Well, yeah, you can. You can, you can get enough people together, probably within your local community, especially since so many people are not involved in the system anymore, and you can actually get drones banned in your city. I mean, they did this in Iowa City, Iowa. They went out and they banned drones over the cities. They banned red light cameras. They banned license plate readers. It, it was a great success for them to be able to do that and said, look, we may not be able to change it for the whole country, but we can change it right here. So we want to encourage people to try to do that. Yeah, exactly. They And they did that in Seattle as well. And, you know, I think that that points to um, a really good direction because for me, I personally tried to, you know, in the whole idea of where volunteerism, libertarianism is, you know, to take action for yourself and to, you know, lead by example. And so I feel like if we start locally and the most local you can be is yourself. So starting with yourself and changing your actions and t deciding to move towards this and showing people, create an example. And then, yes, m finding other people in your town, in your city that you can affect. Because, I mean, frankly, I don't know how you feel, Ben, but I don't have any faith in the federal government. No, no the, the federal government, um, I don't either. But at the same time, I don't think we were ever supposed to have faith in the federal government. The feds have decided to, to um, set themselves up as this great authority over all the states, and they don't really have that right. So we ran a story today that um, Vermont has now stepped out, and uh, they have gone through kind of a nullification process and said, we're going to lift the ban on hemp, industrialized hemp here uh, in Vermont, and who cares what the feds say? And that's great. We need more states to do that. We need states, I know they've already done it in Maine, but the problem in Maine is nobody started planting hemp yet. Yeah. So it's one thing, to, and I understand there's fear there, look, look, there's fear, but that's why you need the state to come forward and say, listen, not only that, but we're not going to allow the feds to enforce federal law on state land. Mm -hmm. You know, if we try to ship that hemp into Maine, then there can be a problem. We try to ship that hemp into New Hampshire, there can be a problem. But if we grow it here and we sell it here, it's not a problem. Um, and, and, you know, take that approach. I think that's really important for them to do. And by the way, it shouldn't be a problem either. The U.S. is the number one importer of hemp around the world. We just don't allow it to be grown here. So. Yeah, exactly. You make a good point with that. You know, and well, if, we, if we're losing faith in the federal government, we're finding that more and more people aren't looking to them for answers, but they're still continuing to make decisions that, that's right. that will affect our lives. And um, possibly in the near future, as, as I know that you're aware uh, that you've covered in your many stories, that... The government has built up quite an apparatus of surveillance, of police state technology, of drones, militarizing the police and things like that. So they're doing things using our money that will and could affect our, our us at some point. You know, in Philadelphia, they've got one of the Bearcat um, little military vehicles. They just tried to put one in Concord in New Hampshire. And these things are continuing to take place. So I, I'm just trying to always move towards solutions for people that they can take and you know definitely i think focusing on the local area what other things do you do in your personal life do you uh, are you involved in any kind of gardening or anything like that yourself uh gardening and and uh working with folks on on food storage um not because i necessarily believe there is you know some huge cataclysmic event coming but i believe it's the right thing to do i think people need to be self-sufficient um and so i have a, a pretty strong community that i'm involved with where we work through a lot of that um, and I think it's just, it's just good to have, you know, you have natural disasters and you have all kinds of things that can come along that, uh, people need to be prepared for. So there are definitely steps you can take as individuals. But again, uh, just going back to this example you used too, over in, in Concord, New Hampshire, in order to get the Bearcat there, th th they applied for this Bearcat and uh, the grant to buy it and called the Free State Project a bunch of terrorists. And that's why they said they needed it. We need it because we have groups, they said like the Free State project or free staters as they called them yeah uh, occupy wall street they referred to them saying they had to be uh to watch out for them um sovereign state project so you know they they were claiming or sovereign citizens i think is what they're called and they were basically saying all these groups that believe in in sovereignty of a state or in the state to not be controlled by the feds um these people are terrorists so one of the steps in that process is not just to reveal that it's happening and we've done a story on it 
But beyond that is what's happening in Concord. Now, I believe the Free State Project folks out there are fighting it. But you got to do more. I mean, I think at that point, you need to go in there, if at all possible. You need to fire your mayor. You need to fire your police chief. You need to send back the Bearcat if you wind up getting it and say, we don't want it. Um, there are processes that you can take. And, I, and I'm excited about the Free State Project because those guys are working through that on a local level, and that's great. But it needs to happen in a lot of communities. You know, if you're in a community where you've got a police chief who doesn't respect rule of law, you need to fire the mayor and then fire him. You can do it. Yeah, definitely. It's it's important for us to to get involved on a local level. And if you and if you choose to run for office, I, you know, I was discussing this earlier in the show. I'm, I don't really choose to work with the state much. Uh, as little as possible, I choose to um, remove their influence from my life as as much as I possible can possibly and maximize my freedom. But I do support people if they want to run for things like city council and and have good intentions. I feel I feel like you know at least if there's going to be people running, we can try to get some things done locally, and that's where we're going to have the most effect. Um, it just seems, you know, the, uh, I don't, I don't want to say that time is running out, but I think that sometimes there is that, that overall feeling of just the direction well, that the government's time moving. Time is definitely short for all of this. I agree with you. I, I think, um, you know, it's not necessarily that it's all said and done and it's, and it's, you know, a, a done deal, but yeah, time is definitely short and Liberty's time is short right now. You know, we, we go around saying Liberty is rising and then I believe that, but I think Liberty's time is very limited here. I think there is an awakening happening around the country of people saying, wait a minute, we've come a long way in the last hundred years, and a lot of what, you know, were my rights as a citizen of this country, and essentially my human rights, uh, have been taken away by encroaching government and growing government, really for the past about 120 years. So it's not an Obama problem, it's not a Bush problem, um, it, it's a problem of a, an elitist, globalist, almost um, to the point of having... Um, um, uh, the, the words escaping me, but uh, having royalty essentially uh, set up in this country where they believe that they are the ruling class yeah. and they get to decide for everyone else how everyone else will live. Um, aristocracy is the word I was, I was th trying to think of there. And that's what we've established here in the United States. I mean, the ruling class has become an aristocracy. And every time in history that that's happened, it's taken a certain amount of time, but there's a generation that can come along and break that. I think we can break it without doing it the way that the French did it and cutting people's heads off. I don't think we have to do that. I think we can restore... Uh, the American Republic the way that it should be um, through the process and do it the right way, but now's our time to do it. It's this generation that has to do it. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Ben, what are your thoughts on anarchy? You know, um, I'm learning more and more about it. I think that there is a lot of truth to the concept of anarchy, which essentially says, you know, I'm not owned by anyone or any government and that there should be no government other than myself. Um, but I don't think most people are ready for that. And I think most people have been conditioned away from it where they really just don't believe they have the ability to protect themselves or care for themselves and that someone has to be able to do it. Uh, I think we've moved society so far from it, it would be very difficult to, to see any real tangible you know, form of that anywhere in the world. Yeah, you know, we uh, I was just discussing earlier and you know, we kind of, we're kind of touching on it now that it takes, you know, a generation or so. I I was saying about 100 to 150 years to see a real big social movement uh, change like that and there's many who think it's uh, I guess a utopian idea. What what I believe really is is sort of what you said there that we all have the ability to rule ourselves and in the absence of the state there would still be um, spontaneous order. Communities would still organize and find ways to protect themselves, to grow food, to do all kinds of things and in fact we would probably and flourish in the absence of the state. We wouldn't have so much overregulation and things to get in the way. And there would always be crime and things of that nature. We're not going to create a perfect world, although I think that it's possible we could evolve that way uh, if we choose to. But, you know, what I'm getting at here is that it seems that believing, putting our belief back in the state, you know, anything bigger than the local level, because I can't even really trust the state government back in Texas. We were just discussing governors and how corrupt governors are and uh, things like that. It's hard to get past even trusting anybody on a local level when you can go to a city council meeting sometimes and see the corruption right there in front of you as well. Yes. So I think that it's just um, maybe we're evolving past the state. Maybe we will get past this state and then realize we don't need it at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be great if we could get to that point. I, again, I think it's, it's difficult to get there because obviously... Uh, I think at its core, uh, most people are corrupt uh, to the extent that there's always going to be those who attempt to control the lives of other people. And so whether it's warlords who say, well, I can hire you know, people and they'll work for me and we'll take everyone else's land, you're always going to have those issues. I think we've had them all throughout human history. So that, 
that never changes. But I do agree with you too. There is a, a natural draw that people have to community. And there's always the opportunity for people to be in communities that protect themselves and, and look out for each other and, and care for each other. I think that's always uh, possible as well. I think technology makes it much more feasible than ever before. Exactly. Um, certainly. Whereas, you know, if you look back historically throughout the history of mankind, one of the things that's always held it back is the lack of technology by those being conquered and the, the control of technology by those doing the conquering. And so I think we've reached a point now where technology is so accessible um, to the average person that it would be much more possible today. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the philosophy of agorism, I don't know if you've ever heard about it, but if you get a chance, man, definitely check out the book, The New Libertarian Manifesto. And uh, that's kind of what it goes into is just that communities could grow up um, and start to create little pockets of freedom, agorist pockets of communities, creating alternative systems and uh, using technology to uh, to advance our freedom as the state sort of collapsed and so it's it's a somewhat idealistic way but it's it's the the method I choose to work that's you know why I'm heavily involved in gardening and barter networks and stuff like that so um, one other thing that everybody I know wants to hear the audience here has been kind of curious about your thoughts on um, Adam's situation yeah yeah you know Adam's situation is is I think very troubling and it certainly should be troubling I, I know that his team, when he was uh, when they kicked the door into his uh, apartment, I believe it was, and uh, and he was arrested. One of the most recent times, um, we posted some of that stuff as they were putting out kind of updates as to what was happening. You know, a lot of people are concerned about it, and rightfully so. I think Adam, um, I've never met him, by the way. Uh, I've, we've talked via Skype before. Um, people that I know who know him well all say the same thing about him, which is that he is a sincere guy. He is an honest guy. Uh, and he truly wants to see the country restored. I mean, he really wants to see um, people have their constitutional rights returned to them and, and the federal government returned to its rightful place, um, limited rightful place. So, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about Adam. I'm concerned about the fact that it seems like everything that he's doing now is coming under more and more attack, um, that there seems to be almost, I don't want to use the term trumped up, uh, because obviously I, I don't know enough about the case to say that, but it seems like I think on the outside that there is a trumping up of charges against him where uh, there's a constant attempt to, to smear him um, and to lock him up if possible. And that's very concerning, considering the fact that um, Adam Kokesh is a guy doing a show on the Internet. I mean, that's, that's essentially what he's doing. He's, he's not out um, causing violent uprisings. He's not out, you know, um, leading marches in the streets and looting and rioting and doing any of that stuff. I and mean, he's doing a show on the Internet, and he's, and he's making his voice heard. And because he's growing in popularity, um, people don't like him who are in power. And that's, and that's very disconcerting. Yeah, exactly. You know, the judge, one of the judges in the number of cases, because you're right, they have been stacking on charges. Uh, there was, in, in the beginning when he first announced the idea of the march, there was immediately... Uh, scrutiny being put on him by the media and attacks of that nature and then the, the arrests started and uh, a lot of false arrests and things like that but the judge said that Adam is a danger to the community and really when we look at that statement it's obvious that a judge who says that really only means that Adam is considered a danger by the state because of you know his his voice is growing in popularity and continues to grow and the message of liberty is a strong one and so um, I think it's it's important, you know, the whole, so far the show we've been kind of discussing the theme that it's important to be careful as um, independent journalists, as activists, as people who are out there speaking truth and trying to bring awareness to a government that is becoming more and more oppressive by the day. And that's, that's what it seems like, that people who are going to be connected to activists or uh, reporters, as we've seen with Glenn Greenwald and his partner, That's right. that they can be targeted now. I mean, what? how do you feel um, yourself being a, a well-known journalist and you're coming from somewhat in the mainstream now and launching your own your own programs now? How, do you, how does that make you feel? Do you feel um, any fear at all for your position? Yeah, I don't feel any fear. Um, having said that, let me just say this too, that um, as you're mentioning, you know, those two cases, I did an interview today with um, Dan Johnson uh, from Panda. We released it on the website. It's up right now at benswan.com. Yeah. But he talks about the fact that he and Stuart Rhodes from Oath Keepers were uh, both sent these emails essentially with child pornography in them from a Tor mail account. About a couple of weeks uh, before this, Luke Rutkowski uh, had that happen to him as well as the guy um, uh, over from um, In the Lie. 
And so all of these guys, these four different guys, have all been connected to emails that have been sent with child pornography. Now, none of them, fortunately, have opened this stuff and downloaded it on their computer. They, they didn't get caught. They were smart enough and, I think, blessed enough to not have, have gotten um, trapped here. But, and they've reported it to police and all that. The bottom line is you have four guys there who have really nothing to do with each other except for the fact that all four um, are pretty outspoken against the National Defense Authorization Act's indefinite detention. That's really the only thing that, that connects the four of them. And the fact is, all four of those guys have been targeted by someone who is attempting to bring them down and have them locked up for child pornography uh, because they don't like what they're saying. And, and so you have that. You have, like you said, what's going on with Adam. You have the, Glenn Greenwald's partner who's detained for hours and held in this airport. You, you see this happening more and more. And I think it's the natural, it is the natural process that we go through when you go from a growing state, totalitarian state, and then those who are pushing back against it. It is the natural process to say, well, the state who has the power is going to go after those who are trying to disrupt that power. Um, for me, myself personally, I have no issue uh, right now as far as fear or concern about it. The way I feel is that this is um, what I'm here to do, just like you. You know, I, I think we've talked about this before. But yeah. there is a time in every generation when you stand up. And so for me, I'm standing up. I'm careful about what I'm opening in my email. I'm careful about what I'm doing. <laughs> But that careful is not going to fix anything. So if they want to come after you, they're going to come after you. Um, you just have to be ready to fight and believe that you're fighting for something worth fighting for. That's exactly right. Yeah, we did talk about that before, and I, and I agree. I mean, there's nothing else more important right now in, in this time in history and in our lives than, than I think this fight. And so, you know, we're, I guess we have to reevaluate the situation, take a look at where the government's headed and continue to find solutions locally. I mean, that's that's the advice that I think I'm getting from tons of journalists and activists. I talked with Cornell West and Chris Hedges yesterday and asked them the same question. I tend to always ask everybody uh, where the solutions are, because that's where I think the focus should be. You know, we've addressed the problems in this movement um, has yeah. picked up over the past few years and everybody has had conferences and festivals and things and talked all about the different problems and now I think we need to start gearing all those those uh, organizational skills and that energy towards focusing on solutions and a lot of that has to be localized you know we need to find out how we can help in our individual areas yeah it's definitely true and I think at the end of the day one thing that's so alarming to those in power about this liberty movement that's growing so much is it is a very strange coalition it's a coalition of libertarians of independents of Tea Party voters, of anarchists, uh, you know, it's yeah. <laughs> Occupy folks, it's, it's, you know, from the grandma who says, you're not going to take my guns, to the, <laughs> the Occupy guy who says the banks are too big. The, the biggest danger of the liberty movement is that it is not pigeonholed into this left-right paradigm that has been, been really propagated for so long in this country. And so it is a huge danger as it continues to grow. You're going to see more and more clamping down. And what I'm expecting to see is a general, very well-funded kind of PR campaign, if you will, that begins to demonize those people so that if you are someone who's kind of on the fringe of it and you say, well, I'm not really sure what I am yet, they're going to make you believe that those people are so dangerous, you don't want to be them. And so that's, I think, the, the coming wave that we're going to see next. Yeah, I think there's there, uh, the 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 ideas of the state is to divide as usual you know that's sort of the power of that uh, the state tries to do is to divide and conquer and we've seen that um, with the Occupy movement, the Tea Party movement, the Liberty movement easily divided in a number of ways and it's it's good though to see uh, to see how we can locally on, on a local level I feel like it's easier to break down those barriers and right. uh, the media obviously plays a role in that and what you do and uh, what many of us out here are trying to do that it's a way for us to reach people still to be entertaining, to reach them with this message in a way that they're used to, which is uh, television programming, to have that same type of format, but to bring real information and then to try to inspire them to actually get involved. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And media can, can be the, the blessing in that. It can also be the curse. And the curse is that you have a lot of folks in media who obviously it is their attempt to say, well, Let's talk about Occupy. And they pick the worst of the worst and they frame the you know, discussion so that it looks like, well, I'm not that person. You know, the thing that media does in this country is everything is based on what I am not. And so they want to try to you know, pigeonhole people by saying, well, you don't want to be like that. You don't want to be like that. So if you're on the left, they say, well, you don't want to be like those hicks over there who you know, are clinging to their guns and their religion. They say to the guys on the right, well, you don't want to be like those crazy people over there who are burning stuff in Oakland. 
And so it's like, you know, we, we divide people as much as possible, as you said. On a local level, when you actually sit down and talk to each other, you find out that, hey, you know, we have a lot in common, and let's focus on the things we do have in common. That way, if we don't agree and we have freedom, then you can leave me alone and I can leave you alone, and we don't have to bug each other. It seems so simple. <laughs> it seems so simple. That's right. So I've got another question, uh, just to change gears here for a minute, Ben. I can't remember if I've asked you about this before, but I definitely haven't asked you to this audience. So we'll go with uh, uh, this new topic here. We're a couple of weeks away from the 12th anniversary of 9-11, and there is a, a huge campaign that has been launched by a coalition of about 40 different organizations, including family members, first responders, who uh, as of, I think, August 6th, they met their goal of $225,000 raised for a global 9-11 campaign. It's called Rethink 9-11. And basically, they're, they're organizing um, locally and getting family members to raise funds, and now they're going to have billboard ads, uh, taxi top ads, um, bus ads, and the biggest one is going to be in New York Times at Times, I mean, on Times Square in New York, and Sydney, London, Vancouver, Chicago, Dallas, all around the world, really. Um, and they're going to have billboards that talk about uh, World Trade Center 7, the third building that fell that day. I'd just like to get your thoughts on that and what you think about this campaign. Obviously, there's still... Um, a, a, a good amount of support out there. They can raise this amount of money and get this campaign going on an issue that many people have dismissed as um, conspiracy. Well, I think it's, it's two things about that. Number one, I think in general, um, it's a subject you're not allowed to talk about, first of all, in America, right? So if, especially if you're in media, you cannot talk about 9-11 because it, the book's closed on that and we're done talking about it, so forget it. Number two, we are now, what, 12 years past 9-11, um, well, I guess it's 12-year anniversary is this year. Um, I think the name Rethink 9-11 is a good name because I think that's what's happening for a lot of people in this country. Uh, a lot of people are rethinking it, and, and on a number of levels. They're rethinking about what happened that day. I think there are those who rethink uh, where it came from, where it all kind of, you know, was 9-11 something we didn't know anything about ahead of time? Did we not know that al-Qaeda was there? Was al-Qaeda really involved? I mean, there are people questioning that. And then I think beyond that, they're rethinking, so what has happened since then? What does the next 12 years now look like for America? And even if there was nothing nefarious about what our government did on 9-11, what happened since then? And how do we get so far off track? So I think there are a lot of different things that are happening there. Um, I will tell you that we are working on a piece um, in conjunction somewhat with Rethink 9-11, so I don't want to tell you too much about it. Yes. Uh, but we are talking with them because uh, I think that part of our project in Truth in Media is that we believe we have an obligation to talk about things that make people uncomfortable. Not for the sake of making them uncomfortable, but because um, when you make people uncomfortable, you do cause them to think. So we're working on that right now, and we'll be releasing it um, pretty soon, but... It's an important subject. It needs to be talked about, and it, and it needs to be talked about in a responsible way so that we can have an intelligent discussion, an intelligent debate, as opposed to um, just being uh, written off immediately as being you know, full of conspiracy theories. Exactly, and I, I'm, I'm very stoked to hear you say that, Ben, because I do have uh, a great amount of respect for the work you do, and especially for that reason, because you have the... Uh, the quality equipment and the quality production and the respect of many people and you still choose to go into the controversial topics that many people stray away from and I hope to, con to continue to see that trend and I expect to see it from you because I wouldn't expect anything else from you and it's great to see that because we need more people. I'll be there in New York City on uh, 9, 10, 9, 11 and then there's a conference taking place in DC that I plan to attend as well so I'm glad to hear that. I really am. Yeah, as I said, you know, I think that um there's nothing wrong with questioning things. And one of the things that we've done in this country is we've taken anyone who questions things, especially journalists, which is crazy to me, right? Because as a journalist, that's the one thing you should do. The one job requirement of being a journalist should be ask questions. And we don't do that anymore. We, we, um, we regurgitate answers. And that's not a good thing. So we, we want to restore the ability of journalists to ask questions without being smeared for it. I've already been called a Sandy Hook truther. I've been called a Boston bombing truther. And, and I know you've seen my stuff, Derek, and I know that, that you know I'm hardly fringe. Like, the <laughs> stuff that I talk about is not cutting edge, like, oh, I can't believe you said that. It's just, we're going to question things when they come up. But when you're called a truther, and, and by the way, I actually consider the, the term truther, I think it's a funny smear, because that's exactly what a journalist should be. Yeah. You should be seeking truth. 
Uh, but we, we've taken this term and we've made it this, this slur to say, well, you're a truther. You, just, you, you think that this is all a lie and there's really some truth out there. I do think there's truth out there. <laughs> and I think that whatever is told to me is probably not the whole truth, no matter who it's coming from. So, you know, I, I, I'm not afraid to, to get into that. I know there's some uh, pushback that always comes as a result of that, but, you know. Yeah, exactly. Gotta you got you got to you got to know what you're pushing for and we're obviously pushing for truth. Adam gave a speech last year uh, in New York on 9/11 and that was basically his point. He said if you're if you're not a 9/11 truther then are you a 9/11 liar or a 9/11 sucker? What are you? If you're not pursuing the truth then you're just swallowing the lies, you know. So I I'd gladly be called a truther any day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think and um, again, the fact that it's you have this term used with everything and invented. I mean, I think I may be uh, one of the only people ever called a Boston bombing truther uh, because it was such a short <laughs> thing. And when I saw it, I was like, and it was, by the way, I've only been called this by other journalists. Oh, <laughs> it's wow. It's never coming from like the public. It's always like some journalist who's like, this guy's a truther. Who's it's attacking a, I mean, Ben Swan? Truther. Who's attacking Ben Swan? Right, because it's like, we don't want you to even ask these questions. And I've actually been criticized a lot, by the way, for asking questions in my reports and not having the answer. Like, they, they, they act like this is like a trick that I use. Like, he, this is his way of being able to ask questions and not have an answer. It's like, <laughs> if I had the answer, I wouldn't ask the question. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a bad thing to encourage people to think sometimes. <laughs> well, I think that's, that's kind of the thought process, right? We don't want you to think too much about it. Take our word for it. And again, like I said, you know, 12 years after 9-11, there's a lot to rethink here. And even if you say, listen, I, it, for me, it's cut and dry. There's no doubt. It happened the way that everyone has said that it happened, and I don't have any questions about it. Fine. But have you rethought where we've gone from there? Have yeah. you rethought the process that we've gone through? Have you rethought the fact that since 9-11, we have d basically taken every single guaranteed protection in the U.S. Constitution, and we've thrown it away? Yeah, exactly. I wanted to read this briefly with you here. This is from Bradley Manning's statement, and he, he's saying that exact same thing. He says, since the tragic events of 9-11, our country has been at war. We've been at war with an enemy that chooses not to meet us on a traditional battlefield, and due to this fact, we've had to alter our methods of combating the risks posed to us. I initially agreed with these methods and chose to volunteer to help defend my country. It was not until I was in Iraq and reading secret military reports on a daily basis that I started to question the morality of what we were doing. It was at this time I realized that our efforts, in our efforts to meet the risk posed to us by the enemy, we have forgotten our humanity. We consciously elected to devalue human life both in Iraq and Afghanistan. We engaged those that we perceived were the enemy. We sometimes killed innocent civilians. Whenever we killed innocent civilians, instead of accepting responsibility for our conduct, we elected to hide behind the veil of national security and classified information in order to avoid any public accountability. He says, we inexplicably turned an eye, a blind eye of torture and executions by the Iraqi government and stomached countless other acts in the name of our war on terror. He says, I am confident that many of the actions since 9-11 will one day be, be viewed in the same light as the Japanese internment camps, the McCarthyism, Dred Scott decision, Trail of Tears, and other crimes by the United States. So, I mean, I, it is important to evaluate what's happened since 9-11, and I, um, you know, I I've definitely have the nights where I go deeper and peel back the different layers of the 9-11 onion and figure, figure out where I, I, I believe, but on the surface, it is important to evaluate what's happened since then and that they c consistently use that as the excuse to erode all of our freedoms. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. And, and the fact is, as uh, Manning says there, go back into even recent history. And when I say recent history, I mean American history is not old history. Uh, and over and over and over again, in, in the lifespan of a very young country, we've seen that happen, where you, you, you take the lives of people and you um, essentially run over their lives for the sake of some plot that you claim at the time is about the, the greater good. And over and over and over that happens. And so I think that uh, he's making a very good point, and it's a very sobering point. Um, all, all of this discussion is sobering. I think when you talk about 9-11 period, when you talk about um, the erosion of constitutional rights, people get fired up about it, but it also should be a very sobering issue because you need to recognize that the, the America that we leave to our children and to their children will not be the America that we're even in today if we don't change it now. And I, I guess either way, it's not going to be the same America. We can either shift it back uh, to a constitutional republic where we go fully in the direction that we're going. But I think that we have to recognize that it is changing. And so, um, you know, as we said before, I guess it's the theme of tonight, but um, in every generation there's an opportunity to, to do something. I think this is it. And I think ultimately guys like Bradley Manning 
and uh, Edward Snowden are going to be remembered as helping to tip the debate. You know, there's growing debate, and then there are moments when it's tipped, and it, and it moves, you know, a significant direction. And I think that's what's starting to happen. Definitely. I very much appreciate you coming and talking with us tonight, Ben. I want to give you a chance to, uh, to end it on that positive note the same way we always do. And there's plenty of people who hear your voice and who are going to hear this later when we load it up. And I want us to use every opportunity we can when we communicate to inspire people. So anything else you want to leave us with, we'd appreciate. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, back in the end of May, I left my job at Fox 19 here in Cincinnati to start this Truth and Media project. And a lot of people asked me why I would do that. And the reason I, I decided to do it was because I believe, as we've been talking about, um, that I want to stand up and be counted among those who are attempting to make real change. Um, there is an opportunity that few people get, and that is an opportunity to be able to influence national debate. Um, I believe that if I have that opportunity, and I believe that you guys have that opportunity, and I, I believe for those who have that, uh, we need to use it to really try to influence the debate and the discussion so that we do leave a more free nation and a more free world to our kids. I have five kids, and I want my kids to grow up in a much better America than I'm growing up in. And I want them to have freedoms that I never had. I certainly don't want them to grow up in, in a nation where they say, you know, we grew up in a country where we don't have anything. Dad, tell us about what it was like when you were young. I don't want to have grandkids who say to me, tell me about what it was like, Grandpa, when you were young. And I say, well, I remember when it was all changing. I want to be able to say, I remember when it was changing, and there were some of us who stood up, and there were some of us who fought back against it, and we pushed back, and this is how it changed. And this is why you have these freedoms today. I think we can do that. If I didn't believe that, I'd just go take a job someplace and <laughs> make some money and whatever. But um, we're doing it the hard way here because I believe this is the right thing to do. And I want to encourage you listeners. You know, if you feel like you don't have a voice and you say, well, I'm not one of those media guys, so what can I do? You know what? We can't do what we do unless you're doing what you do. Meaning you guys have to be out there having the discussions. You have to be informed. You have to be educated. You need to be able to discuss things with people on an intellectual level and, and a smart level and, and a compassionate level. Understanding, G. Edward Griffin told me this. He said, understand that when you share with someone, whether it's about the, the growing police state in this country, about the loss of constitutional liberty, about the Federal Reserve, whatever it is, when you discuss these issues, remember that you don't want to dump the whole thing on them at one time. Just introduce one idea to them that can help to shift their thinking. And then he says, and remember that at one time, you were where they are now. Mm -hmm. So be compassionate with them and be caring with them and try to bring them along carefully. Thank you very much, Ben Swan. Thanks for talking to us tonight. Pleasure. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks. Sir. This is your last word. Whoa, whoa. Hey, hey, hey. And this is Law and Order.